Patrick, I'll hand it over to you. And today we are starting our webinar. Thank you, Norman. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our virtual forum. The topic for discussion today is entitled Beyond Vision 2020, Growth with Equity in the New Decade. This forum is brought to you by the Sheka Institute and the news portal, thevibes.com. Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamed's Vision 2020 has crumbled to dust. It is now obvious Malaysia won't become developed according to World Bank standards this year. And the new 10-year shared prosperity vision announced October last year with Mahathir as Prime Minister looks short on the real stuff to inject any positive spirit into the economy. What will it take to put an economy on terminal decline back on track and go back to the basics of growth with equity? How do we make the economy more productive? Is the only way to increase incomes? What policies must be implemented for the short, medium, and long terms? And what is needed to make this happen? Our speakers today are Professor Jomo Sundaram, prominent economist and former member of the Council of Eminent Persons. Dr. Firas Rad, country manager for Malaysia World Bank. Taufik Ismail, social activist, former MP and corporate figure. Dr. Lee Hock An, economist and current senior fellow at ISEAS Singapore. Professor Graham Kendall, Provost, CEO, and Pro-Vice-Chancellor of the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. And now to begin our virtual forum today, may I invite the Chairman of the Sheka Institute to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, Dato Vinod Sheka. Thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first webinar. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rigorous debate, I'm sure, that will occur after our guests and speakers have, have shared their perspectives and view. Um, Malaysia is going through a very interesting period. And interesting in the sense that it's pretty screwed up, but you know we can, we can understand why. Um, we're talking today of how to go beyond Vision 2020 of Dun Mahathir Mohammed. Let me first uh, explain what the Sheikh Institute is. I mean, the Sheikh Institute is an advocacy organization um, to explain, publicize, and promote the concept of social capitalism or good capitalism. Uh, it's, it's being promoted as a tool to help eradicate poverty, to lift people up uh, via considered debate on social, public, and economic issues, to build awareness and enable an appropriate policy formulation and implementation. Implementation being the key. Um, we talk enough. We need to now push for action. We need to make uh, economic leaders, business leaders understand going forward, uh, it's not just about us making money or doing business. We have to be involved in um, social policies. We have to be involved in society and societal development. And that is the purpose of what the Sheikh Institute is, 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 is set up for. Uh, as a part of that, uh, we've launched uh, successfully the Good Capitalism Forum. The Good Capitalism Forum is to do pretty much the same, but to focus on, on, on good capitalism. Uh, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, over the coming months. We're quite aggressively pushing it. Uh, it's something we believe in completely. But going back to what today's session is about, and I'm excited. I mean, uh, I hope you all realize we have some extraordinary people uh, on this panel. and. Um, we don't often get these individuals to, to speak on subjects related to Malaysia, especially in current times. Um, Vision 2020 is a failure. Uh, it's a failure for many reasons. I am not, uh, and I'm being very open about this, so that's clear, I'm not a supporter of what Tun Mahade did or tried to do. Uh, we didn't need the Twin Towers. The Twin Towers, you know, was nothing. It's just two buildings. Um, our institutions were more important. Uh, Malaysia was in a position to really rule this region and go beyond Korea and anywhere else. That's what we were set up for. And unfortunately, because of the destruction of the institutions around us, with whether it's the judiciary, uh, the way uh, the economics was led, the way uh, corruption was allowed to take hold of our institutions and our basic backbone, um, and, and, and education, everything else. Um, we were God's country. We were given and blessed with wealth, 
and uh, resources that almost no other country had. And we've squandered it. Now, that was in the name of Vision 2020. And of course, we are now in 2020 and we are where we are. I would argue that despite the pandemic, um, we were already heading into a, into a bad position uh, because of the, the structure of our society and economics of our country was being uh, pushed under. But again, that's just a personal view <laughs> which I wanted to share with everybody. Um, I would now like to hand this over to the man that's running this, um, this session and also the executive director of, uh, of the Sheikh Institute. Uh, and uh, I'm proud that uh, Vibes and the Sheikh Institute are doing this together. And you can expect the Vibes uh, and the Sheikh Institute to do a lot more of this because I think this is the only way um, to try and push um, the views of the public, the views of many people that sometimes don't have a voice to, 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 to give. Um, and we want the public to be engaged. Um, so let me just hand this back to Patrick and Gunnar to, to take this forward. And thank you all for participating in this. Um, we have over nearly 400 people that have signed up to join us. And that's extraordinary for a first webinar. And, and I can't thank you all enough. And to all the panelists, again, thank you so much for, for, for being part of this. Um, we're, we're truly honored and, and thankful. Uh, Gunnar, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vinod Cheka. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your moderator for today's virtual forum, the executive director of the Sheka Institute and the editorial consultant of thevibes.com, Mr. P. Gunasegram. Thank you very much, Patrick. First, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our speakers and attendees. And uh, let me just put the discussion into perspective today and uh, allow me to share my screen. All right, we are talking about beyond Vision 2020 uh, today, growth with equity in the new decade. Now, this, uh, this, this is about uh, looking uh, beyond this uh, particular year and uh, 2021 and, and uh, right up to the uh, year 2013. So, and uh, the, uh, the purpose of this discussion, uh, the, the, sorry, um, having, all right. uh, the purpose of the discussion is how to achieve maximum in income growth with equitable distribution of income in the new decade. So the, the, uh, this will necessarily have to involve key broad principles rather than specifics. But we, before we go on, we need to look at the past plans and how they did. This will then provide the necessary context from which we can spring forward. And uh, we need to realize that all planning from the 1970s onwards arose from this mother of all plans, which is the new economic policy. So uh, this, was, uh, this was under Thun Razak in the aftermath of the 1969 racial riots, uh, following which there was, uh, it was considered that there was a pressing need to do something to reduce the income and other gaps between the races. So the, do, the two prongs of the new economic policy were the eradication of poverty irrespective of race, the elimin elimination of the identification of race with economic function. Um, generally, most economists at that point consider it a good blueprint for development with distribution coming out of rapid growth so that nobody feels deprived. Unfortunately, we, we all know that the 30% corporate ownership target, which is basically an administrative target, became the de facto measure of success. And this laid the groundwork for the emergence of uh, crony capitalism when 30% uh, shares in many companies were being uh, distributed to various companies and individuals. So th there were also disputes of, uh, of measurement and whether there was the 30% target was actually uh, achieved. At the end of the period, it was decided that the broad principles would continue in the, into the next plan because all the objectives were not uh, achieved. So this, this is the... Uh, uh, this is the NAP, and this led uh, um, the uh, Tun Abdurazak's successor, Hussein On, continued with this policy during his time and established Permodala National Burahat of PNB, which was set up in 1978 as a trust fund for Bumiputras to hold corporate stakes. 
and to fast track the development of uh, Bhumi Putra managerial class, both of which were commendably achieved uh, by and large, that is. Uh, so when uh, 1990 came, uh, then the, uh, it, it was generally felt that uh, by at least the political administrators that the, uh, that the NEP was not achieved. And uh, there was a, a broad, uh, another policy which was put, put in place, which is called Vision 2020 under Mather. And this was to become a fully developed country by the year 2020. Some of the challenges uh, and targets which were raised was a united country, a psychologically liberated country, mature and democratic, moral and ethical, liberal and tolerant, scientific and progressive, caring, economically just, prosperous, uh, quite ambitious, uh, but uh, much of it was not achieved as we can, uh, we'll see. The, but the, the policy continued under Mahathir, as well as under Abdullah Badawi after that, as well as Najib. So the, uh, the nation did not meet the goal of becoming developed under World Bank definitions in 2020. And uh, it did not uh, overcome these nine challenges. The problems we faced are very much with us. Uh, more strides were made in terms of increasing incomes and living standards, but not by enough to consider the country developed uh, and its people provident, uh, prosperous. The evidence indicates some income gaps actually widened, not necessarily between races, but between the rich and the poor of all races. A class gap was emerging. So the uh, the shared property the uh, the shared property uh, region. Uh, I think I've missed one slide. All right, this is the one that uh, the, the, this is the uh, before we come to the shared property well, prosperity region, we have to look at the new economic model first. Uh, so this was uh, under uh, under Najib, and it sort of like incorporated the uh, the the uh, NEP as well. So it aimed for a better quality of life for all, and the three prongs were high income, uh, sustainability, and inclusiveness. So the these were the last ten years of Vision 2020, the age of Pumandu, you know, under Idris Jalal uh, in the P PM's department. And uh, some of y'all will remember the economic transformation program, the government transformation program, and KPIs, uh, KPIs, key performance indicators for ministers, which was a world first at that time. And so the, uh, the following the Vision 2020, the new economic model, uh, we can criticize Najib for 1MDB and uh, his, all his other transgressions. But the NEM was the only policy which had clear quantifiable targets. It had achievements dates and key performance indicators. Some things at least were being achieved uh, under the new economic model. The Harapan government completely dismantled uh, Pumandu, which was already on the way out after it came into power, which was a pity, but it offered little in its place. And it came up with the shared prosperity vision. So this is the uh, shared uh, prosperity vision from 2021 to 2030. Again, uh, this was under Mahathir for second time around. And uh, the architect of this plan is considered uh, to be Asmin Ali under the new Ministry of Economic Affairs. So it talks about the decent, of, decent standard of living for all. There were three objectives, development for all, closing wealth and income gaps, united, prosperous and dignified uh, nation. This was the most wishy-washy of all the plans. Emphasis was, was on redistribution instead of growth. There were no quantifiable targets, no growth strategies. So that was the uh, uh, problem with the shared prosperity vision. So let me stop sharing the screen here. And then, uh, so let's move on to the discussions now. Uh, speakers, if you have any pressing questions you would like to ask during the discussion of other speakers, please feel free to do so. Uh, other webinar attendees, you can start posting your questions as we go along and we will try and answer as many as we possibly can. My first question will be directed to Professor Jomo Syndrome. As a journalist, I remember calling Jomo some 40 years ago for an economist's point of view on Proton. 
he was already an associate professor at the University of Malaya then. He has done, uh, he has since done many things. He's currently a prolific columnist, a research advisor at Kazana Research Institute and visiting fellow at the Institute for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University in New York, amongst others. Earlier, he was a member of the powerful Council of Eminent Persons, amongst others. Uh, this was said to be more powerful than the cabinet in the formulation of policy by former Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad during his second innings of the wicket. His past achievements include, amongst others, UN Sec Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development and Assistant Director General for Economic and Social Development at the, at the Food and Agricultural Organization. He has produced and edited numerous books and publications in economics. He was educated at the Royal Military College in Malaysia, Yale, where he obtained his bachelor's, and Harvard, where he obtained his doctorate. Before I ask him the first question, for the record, 40 years ago, he opposed the National Car Project under Proton. Now, Jomo, we know that uh, Martyr's Vision 2020, ironically, Martyr was PM for part of uh, this year, that is, did not materialize in terms of the admittedly narrow definition of developed country status by the World Bank, which was a GI uh, gross national income per capita of around US 12,600 for 2019. Malaysia's GNP per capita was uh, US 11,200. What were the reasons for this failure? And was it a meaningful failure? You know, after all, it was only a 13% short fall after all. Thank you very much, uh, Gunnar. And thanks to everybody for inviting me to join you today. I wish your institute well in trying to promote a much more uh, critical discussion about the issues uh, which face the nation. Now, uh, coming back to your question, I think um, I would be a bit more generous about the importance of Vision 2020. The most important thing about Vision 2020 was the recognition that the Ruku Nagara and the MEP had not succeeded in uniting the nation, which was what its real aim was supposed to be. Re poverty eradication and restructuring society were means to an end. The end was to create an, uh, a national unity after the what happened in uh, May 69. So I think um, if you think about um, Vision 2020, the commitment to creating a Malaysian nation was the first time this was being articulated since 1947, when the People's Constitution was advanced and offered such a vision. And it's not surprising because the speech uh, associated with Vision 2020 was drafted by three former colleagues, uh, including uh, uh, Rostam Sani, who these three colleagues were all at the Institute for Strategic in in International Studies. So there was this shared vision. And th this was really the objective of Vision 2020. Unfortunately, for reasons we all know, um, it was abandoned with the financial crisis of 97, 98, and the political fallout, and particularly the split between Mahadir and Anwar. But I think it is important to keep that, that objective in mind uh, because the abandonment of Vision 2020 from that time basically meant we were basically making it up as we went along. And we have had all these, what I call ethno-populist um, uh, tendencies ever since then. Now, coming very specifically to your question, Guna, you, you emphasized the question of, bec of becoming a developed country. And that certainly was part of the vision. But as you remind us with your excellent slide, the vision was actually had nine, different, nine objectives. And these nine objectives were uh, towards becoming a modern, uh, liberal, uh, democratic nation. All of this, which, which are already articulated in the Ruku Negara and so on, but elaborated and certainly, I think it is important for us to recognize the modernist vision uh, involved. And uh, uh, the late Tan Sri Shekhar, for example, was very much part of this, this recognition of the need for modernization. He contributed a great deal to the, to the creation uh, of, of the Academy of Science and so on and so forth. So I think uh, the failure of uh, to achieve uh, developed country status is, of course, very lamentable. But I think what we had by the reduction which, um, of Vision 2020 to the new economic model, which frankly, I, 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 I think most people don't even know 
about all these quantitative targets uh, which you which you which you referred to, um, um, and this target reducing the whole developed country status to becoming a high income country, uh, a category as you correctly pointed out, which is basically defined by the World Bank, uh, was very, very unfortunate because what happened was that it resulted in a lot of statistical fudging. And so we see, for example, in Malaysia, there are more than 4 million uh, undocumented foreign workers who are not counted. So you have a numerator about how much out output is produced in this country. And then you have a denominator which, which, which excludes almost one quarter of the actual labor force. And this is one quarter of the labor force who work under the most uh, difficult conditions, the 3D types of positions and so on and so forth. So we, have, so we were supposedly, before the 20, 2018 elections, of becoming a high income country, just slightly short of it. But it was basically because we had this kind of statistical funding uh, with the, by excluding the contributions of, of foreign labor particularly the undocumented foreign labor. This, I think, is something which is not something yeah. which, which, which we should... Uh, Jomo, if I can just uh, add, on to, uh, add on a question there. What do you think should be some of the meaningful measures of a developed country now? And how do you think we have done in terms of these measures? I think, the, I think uh, regardless of what it means to be a developed country uh, uh, generally, I think if you look at the Vision 2020 objectives which you talk of which you identified and the, 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 the continuities and the changes from uh, 1971 to 1991. Um, I, I don't find anything terribly objectionable about the objectives of Vision 2020 in the first place. Um, and uh, th this idea of a shared prosperity vision which has since uh, come up, uh, whether or not we achieve developed country status or high income status, frankly, uh, you know, what, what does it all mean? You can have a high income status uh, with a, with a, um, uh, and, and have a very authoritarian uh, uh, government uh, as you, you have in some parts of the world today. Um, or you can have the worst, the most divisive types of uh, societies. Uh, and we, we have seen the rise of ethnopopulism in the West. And these are all problems which, which I think uh, we certainly do not want in Malaysia. So regardless of the formal definition of what the OECD considers to be a developed country or what the World Bank considers to be a high income country, I, I think what we, we should be asking ourselves is what do we need in this nation? And that I think is the, is the, is the real challenge. All right, but if you look at those nine uh, measures, okay, united country, psychologically liberated, mature and democratic, moral and ethical, liberal and tolerant, scientific and progressive, caring, economically just prosperous. Wouldn't you say that almost all of it has not really been, uh, been achieved? I agree with you. I, I agree with you. But so the, where do we go forward from here? Um, well, unfortunately, I think what we have right now is uh, we, have, uh, we have moved back rather than move forward. Uh, we don't have a public discourse and, and, uh, which, which will move us forward. And that's why I think uh, the, 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 I think your 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 effort today uh, to try to remind us of Vision 2020. Uh, not not we I fully acknowledge that it, that it has not been realized. But I the to 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 throw the baby out with the bathwater to say that Vision 2020 was was a, was a, was a was a terrible vision to begin with. I think uh, really um, is most unfortunate. Okay, uh, the, then uh, what do you think we can move towards meeting these ends? You know, uh, well, I, what are I think, some things? I think right now we are in a very unfortunate situation of having uh, a, a politics which is pre predominant, which is primarily concerned uh, with, with, with uh, the self-preservation of the ruling coalition and, uh, you know, and various measures which are being done to, 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 to preserve its survival. This is not a time when you when you actually can have a, a terribly uh, useful discussion uh, of the, some of the larger considerations which you correctly want us to focus on. Uh, likewise, uh, with COVID-19, uh, I think we have the very, very unfortunate situation of, um, you know, that business as usual is certainly not an option. 
And this is where, and, and, and I think it is very also important for us to recognize that we have not learned enough from the experiences of other societies. Other societies where, for example, affirmative action has been practiced and where it has succeeded, where it has failed. Uh, other societies where, for example, ethno-populism has reared its ugly head, uh, in, in, if, if, especially in the West in recent years. Uh, we need to begin to understand, for example, the Hindutva phenomenon in India and how it has uh, divided Indian society in ways which are not going to be easy to put back. So we need to begin to learn and, and uh, from, from all these different experiences. Um, and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, earlier mention was made about good capitalism. There was a recent okay. debate over the whole question of stakeholder capitalism versus uh, shareholder capitalism, sure. uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. We you know that, that we need to be open to a lot of these discussions, and that's why it is important for us to to begin to appreciate the the discussions but also to have a, a, a balanced assessment, a realistic assessment of our own past in order for us to move forward. I think um, Vinod has got a question, I think. So Vinod, can you come in? Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, John, Profess, Prof. Um, I think you're right. Maybe I shouldn't, I, I, I wasn't clear enough that I'm, I shouldn't be harsh on the idea of Vision 2020 being a bad idea. It never was a bad idea, just like one Malaysia was not a bad idea. Uh, of Najib. It all had the right attitude and the right purpose, perhaps, uh, behind it. The unfortunate thing is, as, as you said, it, it's always taken over by political necessity. And I think that's the problem with Malaysia, isn't it? I mean, the hardcore poor in this country, the majority are still the Malays, after however many years of NEP and any other program you want that, 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 that we can term it as. Um, race relations have, have gone to its worst period than it's ever been. Polarization is as, is as bad as it's ever been. Uh, at schools, at colleges, uh, in society in general. Um, and so I, I think the reality is we, we, we need to blend the two, don't we, uh, Prof? I mean, it's not just the idea that the, the vision was good, because you're right, people like you, people like Greg Rastam Sani, these are incredible individuals that came up with this right idea of what the politicians should push forward with, okay. how the stakeholders should push, push forward with. But the problem in the Malaysia is the politics, political necessity has okay. always taken front and center. Fine, and, we'll, and we'll come back to this uh, later. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Lee Hua Khan. Uh, and um, uh, he's senior fellow at the ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute, Singapore. He has researched and published works on affirmative action, discrimination, inequality, social protection, labor and uh, education with a focus on Malaysia. He's the author of the forthcoming book, Affirmative Action in Malaysia and South Africa, Preference for Parity, and co-editor of The Defeat of Barisan National, Miss Signs of Late Search. He's also a senior fellow with the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs and an associate research fellow with the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research. Uh, Hakan, let's go back to the new economic policy. Uh, the twin aims were er eradication of poverty irrespective of race and the elimination of identification of economic function with race by 1990. Uh, the de facto uh, success of the NEP has moved to that of an administrative target of 30% equity ownership by the Bumi Putra community in companies. What are the merits and demerits of uh, such a target? And what do you think should be the measurements for the success of the NEP? Thank you very much, Guna. Good morning to everyone. And also, uh, thanks to the organizers for the chance to uh, share my thoughts on this uh, subject. I just have two slides to share, and I'll try to uh, keep it really compact. I think it's timely to talk about the NEP. You know, next year marks its 50th anniversary. Now, the NEP stood out for making a two-pronged distinction between poverty alleviation, regardless of race, and to quote, social restructuring to reduce and eventually eliminate the identification of race with economic function. It is important to maintain this clear distinction and to think of the second prong of the NEP as affirmative action. The first prong's objectives and instruments are specific poverty alleviation through providing basic needs, basic schooling, infrastructure, uh, rural development, and on the whole, programs to boost income and welfare of the lowest income households. Uh, the second prong is fundamentally different. Um, this is affirmative action as the concept is defined globally. In Malaysia's context, the policy objective is to promote participation of the Bumiputras and disadvantaged groups in higher education, 
professional and management positions, business and ent entrepreneurship and ownership. And the key instrument is preferential treatment extended to the beneficiary group based primarily on identity, whether race, ethnicity, gender, caste, and so on, and not by poverty. Ultimately, affirmative action must develop capability and competitiveness such that the beneficiary group can graduate out of needing the preferential treatment. The NEP's aspiration was for Bumiputras to be full participants in the economy. Now, the NEP distinguished pro-poor need-based policies and saw that such interventions can reinforce but not replace Malaysia's massive system of pro-Bumiputra affirmative action. I know this is a slightly different take, I think, from what is popularly held. It can reinforce but not replace the entire system. I just want to uh, reiterate. Now, these paramount distinctions are no longer appreciated in Malaysia. We have spent more than a decade in a muddle about doing so-called need-based or pro-B40 affirmative action as a systemic replacement for race-based affirmative action. But we end up conflating the NEP's first and second prongs. And after many years, we see no systematic plan of action and no policy specifics. In speaking of reforms, we should instead focus on making affirmative action more effective in its ultimate objective of promoting capability in the specific policy areas of higher education, professional management positions, enterprise, and ownership. This brings me to the 30% Bumiputra equity target and measures of success. I think NMP placed too much emphasis on this. Bumiputra equity ownership became the most popular yardstick of the NEP's progress. Consequently, less attention was given to higher education achievement and enterprise development, which more fundamentally involved learning and capacity building. The two most studiously tracked affirmative action measures over the decades have been Bumiputra equity ownership and share of occupations. Bumiputra higher education enrollment and academic achievement and enterprise growth and development were not robustly monitored, which shows they were not top priorities. Ultimately, this fixation with the 30% has omitted atten attention to other policy goals, which I would argue are more important because they are primarily concerned with productive participation and capability. The evidence shows that Bumiputra SMEs are more concentrated at the micro scale. Likewise, the vast majority of Bumiputra contractors are small. As you can see here in class G1, it's 25%, that's one out of seven uh, classes, and very few, uh, and most remain that way. Now, these policy areas have substantially fallen short in the quest of cultivating dynamic Bumiputra enterprise. And you can also see that the data are very scarce and not reported regularly, 2005, 2015, 2011. Another outcome of fixation with 30% equity is neglect of one achievement. This may come as a surprise. The NEP originally broke down the 30% into 7.4% individual Bumiputra ownership and 22.6% trust agency or, invest or institutional holdings. By 1985, noted here as 1990, about the same, Malaysia had achieved at least 7.4% Bumiputra individual ownership. The measurement of Equity ownership has triggered debate. Is Bumiputra ownership under or above 30%? But I don't think this debate is conclusive and stalemate over the numbers is ultimately not particularly constructive. Affirming the original NEP offers a different path, causing us to record the milestone past, which means that there are more grounds to maintain programs for institutional Bumiputra ownership, but less for wealth transfers to Bumiputra individuals. Now come 2021, some will exalt the NEP Others will decry its overstay. We will hear unflattering echoes of the never ending policy. These laments and their underlying sentiments should be acknowledged. But if we harp on personal grievances and popular but selective accounts of the NEP's failures without presenting a path forward, we will only further entrench the system. I think Malaysia must critically address the need for affirmative action to do better in broadly developing Bumiputra capability and competitiveness. Yes, over the course of perhaps a few more decades as an integral prerequisite for reform. But because ultimately it's up to a momentous mass of the majority becoming empowered, confident, and willing to undertake genuine change and transformation. Uh, yeah, I, that's, that's about all that I have prepared. I mean, maybe to address further uh, what you think should be the measures, I think I, I come back to that and, and we need to be clear and more systematic that 
there is a, there is a whole regime of, of policies specifically involving higher education, uh, the high level occupations, enterprise and, and ownership and be targeted in how we analyze and come up with specific goals and go beyond just you know, the quantitative, but also to the qualitative and hence the distinction between uh, you know, how I think NEP has achieved a lot in terms of granting access and, and, and numerical and achieving some numerical goals, but it's really falling short in terms on the, on the qualitative front, in terms of the academic achievement, in terms of like which we see here, the scale of, of enterprise and you know, uh, dynamism and competitiveness and so on. Uh, thank you, Wagon, for that. Uh, we'll come back to some of the points uh, later, especially with respect to perhaps uh, you know, uh, promoting micro enterprises as one way of, uh, of, of affirmative action, for instance. You know? So now uh, uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, obviously, to achieve all these, we need to have growth. Uh, I think uh, maybe the, I think the screen is still being shared. All right. So obviously, to achieve all this, we need to have growth, equitable growth. In other words, creation of wealth and measures to enable to ensure equitable uh, distribution. Let me introduce Dr. Firas Rad. Uh, Firas is a Jordanian national, uh, and he's the world uh, country manager for World Bank country manager for Malaysia. He was formerly the country manager for Kuwait. Firas joined the World Bank in 2002 as a senior health policy specialist. He has extensive health policy experience in various countries in the Middle East and North America. Um, uh, Firas, uh, the, there are a few questions I have for you. The first one, which are the areas that you see for growth in Malaysia and how can we achieve exceptional growth with equity in Malaysia? For, for, from, uh, I mean, you have had a pretty good look at the Malaysian economy. You should be able to give some suggestions. Well, thank you, Agun. I just want to make sure you hear me clearly before I start. I can hear you clearly. Okay, well, wonderful. Yeah. Well, let me first uh, thank you, uh, Guna, for the kind invitation uh, to participate in the discussion today on uh, Malaysia's uh, economic journey over the next decade and uh, to join this uh, distinguished panel of, uh, of speakers. Um, on your question about areas of growth uh, in Malaysia, we know from experience in other countries uh, that uh, becoming prosperous and climbing up the income ladder uh, makes it all the more harder to sustain high rates of economic uh, growth. And as everyone knows, I think on this panel and perhaps in the audience, Malaysia has indeed had one of the highest growth rates uh, around the world over the past uh, 60 years, <coughs> the seventh highest amongst uh, countries that we have data for. And this is a remarkable uh, expansion and growth over time, which uh, succeeded in lifting up millions of uh, Malaysians out of poverty. It improved living standards and uh, in, in enabled investments in health and education and, and modernized uh, the country's infrastructure. Now at the moment, um, although Malaysia has not yet crossed the threshold of becoming a country with an advanced uh, economy um, by OECD uh, definitions or uh, the World Bank's, it's still getting within striking distance of reaching that milestone. And in our view, uh, according to our estimates, it's expected to do so over, over the next uh, decade. <coughs> and it will be following uh, many countries that have done so recently, uh, namely Argentina, Latvia, Uruguay, Poland. In fact, there are about 19 countries that have been able to cross that threshold over the last uh, 30 years. <clears throat> and we call them the transitional uh, economies. Now, looking forward, the questions uh, for Malaysia then become, um, how do you sustain and revitalize economic growth rates over the next decade? And what else does the country need to do to prepare itself uh, for this transition? <clears throat> because the goal is not to surpass an average numeric uh, threshold but to become uh, a nation with a more advanced and competitive economy, more effective systems to boost human capital in the areas of health, education, <clears throat> and social protection, and institutions and policies that help enable this transition. If you excuse me, I'll just take a drink. <clears throat> and, and lastly, how do you ensure um, that this growing economic prosperity is shared uh, appropriately, which 
goes to the title of this panel, Growth with Equity in the Next Decade. Now I'll say a few things about these questions and then <clears throat> I'll be happy to engage in a discussion. Um, on revitalizing long-term economic growth over the next decade, we see several import important drivers. And these include investment growth, both public and private, uh, productivity growth, which has been a big focus of, of the government, which is really influenced, in my view, by the pace of innovation and economic efficiency, uh, human capital outcomes, especially in education and skills that will be competitive in a modern economy, and, and lastly, greater female uh, participation in the labor force. Malaysia's gender gap in, in labor force participation is around 25%, uh, which is much higher than many countries in Southeast Asia, including Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and Singapore. Um, the only countries that have a higher gender cap um, are the Philippines, Indonesia, um, and, and Myanmar. Um, now, these areas would be the ones, in our view, that will drive Malaysia's longer-term economic uh, growth. Um, and we have simulated how changes in these factors can affect uh, Malaysia's uh, future growth rates. Uh, now, in preparing Malaysia for this transition, I'd, I'd mentioned five general areas that we think are vitally important. And as Professor Jomo said, you know, it's, it, it's not important whether you cross this threshold or, or not. Uh, what is important is that uh, it, is, it is what it becomes is meaningful for the average Malaysian uh, in terms of what he or she uh, feels uh, day in, day out in terms of the quality of institutions, the quality of services, the quality of systems, and so on. Um, now, the five general areas that we think are, are vitally important for preparing Malaysia for this transition uh, first is, is booting, boosting competitiveness. Uh, Malaysia's overall competitiveness is, is ranked high, but relative to comparators, uh, there are gaps and the gaps may be widening. So more needs to be done in our view to remove distortions, encourage innovation, strengthen competition, improve uh, the investment climate and, and to deepen uh, regional integration. Um, the second area is creating jobs. Uh, creating well-paying, high-quality jobs for Malaysians is, is becoming uh, more challenging as, as Malaysia moves towards a higher income status. And as we all know, the nature of work uh, is changing. Um, certain gaps have emerged in the skills framework and some activities uh, are threatened, as we know, by automation. And, and this probably will continue uh, in the future. Um, in our view, reforms will be needed uh, to strengthen basic um, health uh, services, to strengthen learning outcomes, to facilitate uh, lifelong learning and, and digital literacy. And then, um, you know, very importantly, to attract and retain talent. Um, and this, you know, can, can also be connected to uh, the question of affirmative uh, action. Um, and third area is, is modernizing institutions. And we feel that uh, although Malaysia has done very well in the past, there are um, lags in institutional quality um, and Malaysia is not where it should be relative to, to peers uh, in the region and, and beyond. Uh, we think uh, reforms are needed going forward to enhance government effectiveness, to strengthen inclusion and accountability and oversight in government operations and, and policy making, and to improve competition in this state business nexus that uh, a lot of commentators have uh, focused on, and to build, uh, you know, build back a greater bureaucratic uh, capacity. Uh, because I think having a very effective civil service, effective institutions are, are, are tremendous um, enabling factors that will help this, this transition to, to becoming a, a developed nation. Um, then a, a very important area um, is, is how Malaysia will finance uh, this transition and how it will finance shared prosperity. Um, and this will require, um, uh, I think, a, a tremendous effort to raise more revenue and to spend it more effectively. Uh, reforms will be needed uh, to increase tax revenues and to strengthen the social safety net in Malaysia and to, to target assistance uh, more effectively. Um, government revenue, and I think people know this in 2019, was was only about 17.4% of, of GDP. 
and, and that's about 25% lower than what it was in, in 2012. Um, and this figure, you know, this average figure is, is well below what we see in upper middle income countries, which is around 28%. And then in advanced uh, economies, it's around 36%. So, so Malaysia will have a challenge uh, to, to finance this transition with uh, such uh, you know, uh, a low base of revenues. Um, and it will have to think creatively of, of what uh, it, uh, it can do. And this also will be aggravated with a, a phenomenon that we are seeing a mega trend, which is this phenomenon of population aging. And uh, this uh, will have macro fiscal implications. It will have implications for the labor force, but also uh, very importantly for uh, the social protection system in Malaysia, particularly the, the pension system. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, and this goes you know, back to the, the third question uh, or, uh, or answer I'd like to, to provide, uh, it's about promoting inclusion. And this you know, goes to, again, the title of the, of the forum. Um, and recently in Malaysia, um, growth uh, has become less inclusive uh, than in the past, uh, deepening disparities and encouraging the perception that growth has not benefited everybody in an equitable way. Um, we think here in this area, there is a lot, uh, a lot of work uh, to be done. Um, the social protection system is indeed very broad, but it is shallow uh, in terms of the benefits it provides um, and uh, does not ensure sufficient access to services and opportunities uh, by those uh, at risk of being left behind. And, and these include, you know, health, education, employment, and most importantly, housing. Uh, I think there's a big national debate that should occur around this question of, uh, of affordable housing. Um, and uh, we know this is a, a challenge for, for uh, many uh, households in, in Malaysia. Um, I'd like to, and if I could just finish with two points, sure, Guna, sure. if you allow me. Sorry, I for extent. Um, I think COVID-19 um, really revealed some of the underlying weaknesses uh, of Malaysia's social protection system, um, which now should generate more reforms. And we did in our Malaysia Economic Monitor Report in July, focus very heavily on uh, social protection, because this is a, an instrument to protect the vulnerable, to protect the poor in a very difficult moment now in, in this country's uh, uh, life uh, with the, the impact of COVID-19. Um, and then over the longer term, I, I just also wanted to emphasize um, how this, this phenomenon of population aging is going to cut across uh, many of these, uh, these issues. And uh, we will be uh, putting out a, a new report on, uh, on this challenge for Malaysia in a few weeks time. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Guna, um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Siraj. We will come back to some of the points later. Uh, we are getting some questions in, but I think uh, let me just finish uh, with one round of the speakers before we go on to the questions. So politics is likely to be a constricting factor for the implementation of some of these uh, measures that we have. You know? So let me introduce Taufik Ismail, a former MP, a prominent social activist, and a person who was previously involved as well in the corporate sector in various organizations. He's currently trying to get back into politics as an independent candidate for parliament. His father is the late Tun Dr. Ismail Abdurrahman, former deputy prime minister. Taufik played a key role in the publication of his dad's uh, biography, The Reluctant Politician, which, uh, which was a very, uh, was an excellent book, which provided behind the scenes, uh, uh, no, the scenes of, uh, behind the scenes uh, uh, picture of what was happening in Malaysian politics during a very crucial uh, period of our time. So uh, Taufik, uh, how successful do you think uh, the NFP has been? What was done right, wrong and right? And what do you think are some of the main political impediments to growth with equity in Malaysia? Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Gunnar, for hosting this um, and to the Saka Foundation for inviting me. Um, first of all, I don't think the NFP has been successful partly because uh, we have a problem in management of the NEP uh, on the political side. Uh, I think um, we've, we've had a, a, a problem uh, which uh, in corporate terms uh, translates to um, 
a succession failure uh, when it comes to management of the country and of the economy. I think um, we've seen this in the last uh, year or so, but especially since uh, Mahathir became prime minister, succession planning has not been one of his uh, major strengths. And uh, we have not been able to see any clear uh, guideline as to who is going to move this country forward or who's going to set the economic uh, trends uh, for the future for the generations to come. I think um, one of the uh, experiences personally which I've had is that um, uh, being from, from, from a medical uh, a family um, with many doctors in my family, uh, ethical doctors do not lie to their patients intentionally. And I think uh, uh, the doctors that we've had uh, advising us in the last uh, decades or so have not been entirely honest as to our ailments or the cures that are meant to be put in place to uh, achieve what we were supposed to achieve. I think um, we do need to do a lot of structural reform, especially in institutions which are governing the country and also we need to look very closely at the issues of national integration, which I think is sadly lacking because we have not been able to unite the people between the East and West, Western parts of this country for a better economic future. I think um, we need to look also at the uh, types of um, industries that, that we expect uh, the Malays to be in uh, do we want the Malays to move from being an agricultural class to being a labor class uh, in industrial terms? Uh, where is the progress that we have been promising the Malays for the last uh, 40 years or more? Um, I don't think there has been much success by any of the major parties that have been trying to lead us. And I think uh, we do need to look very closely at the party system as a means of selecting leaders for this country. And I think this is where uh, we need a political shift in the way we select uh, the management of this country. Okay. Thank you very much for that topic. Uh, some of the points will come back to it again. Uh, just uh, something on education now, much of what we can do is anchored in education. Uh, there are twin aims here too under the National Education Blueprint. One is to produce an educated and skilled workforce and two, to nurture and develop the brains needed to make advancements in all areas. Let me introduce uh, you to Professor Dr. Graham Kendall, the Provost and CEO of the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. He is also Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Nottingham in UK. He was awarded a BSc Honours First Class in Computation from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, UK in 1997 and received his PhD from the University of Nottingham, UK, School of Computer Science in 2000. Prior to becoming an academic, uh, Graham worked in the IT industry for almost 20 years. Graham has been in Malaysia since August, 2011. Graham, uh, you will be well placed to make an assessment of the quality of students who enter your university and what is lacking. Uh, some comments here, please. And then uh, a broad question. How do you think we can improve education to help provide the anchor for a growing economy with equitable distribution? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Guna, and um, thanks to the Shaker Institute and to the Vibes for hosting this. Um, as the introduction said, I'm a, really a computer scientist and I'm uh, head up the University of Nottingham, Malaysia now. So in the interest of academic freedom, I'm not really placed to comment on the economics of things. I'll try, but um, I'm not really uh, qualified. But when I look at the education sector in Malaysia, and I've been here nine and a half, ten years now, I think there's a lot of positives. If you look at um, University of Malaya, for example, which I believe is the best university in, in Malaysia, they're in the top 100 now. They're ranked 70 in the world, uh, which is remarkable considering um, a few years ago they were outside the top 200. You've got uh, 11 foreign branch campuses, five from the UK here, uh, including the University of Nottingham, Malaysia, and some in Johor and uh, various others. Um, it's increased research. Um, I think it's, it's gone really well over the last few years. You can see a definite increase in the research that has happened 
in Malaysia. And coming back on a couple of points that um, other people have made around um, inclusion. I mean, when we talk about inclusion in Malaysia, we normally talking about the Bunipucha, um environment or One Malaysia. But actually, one of the things that struck me when I first came here is I'm a computer scientist. So I, I worked a lot with UKM and UPM in the early days. And if you go into the UK, into, the, into my school, School of Computer Science, there's hardly any women in there um, as professors of computer science. But in Malaysia, I was amazed that a lot of um, computer scientists and a lot of professors of computer science are women in, in Malaysia. And I, at that point, thought I was struck by how um, inclusive Malaysia was. I think I don't. I think that was a um, not a false impression, but maybe a biased impression. And I think. Malaysia probably does need to look at the EDI agenda, the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion agenda, and actually work out what it means. Does it mean just gender? Does it mean um, one Malaysia? Does it mean racial, racial things? So, you know, that's something that I think Malaysia is actually quite good at, but it, um, it gets, I don't know, it gets polarised, I think, with politics. I also think Malaysia is getting a reputation. We came out here in 1997, started operating in 2000, because Malaysia wanted to be known as a global hub in education. And I think it's achieved that, but I think 20 years on, it probably could have done a lot more. But we're now reaching out, um, not just us, but I'll give you a couple of examples of what we're doing. We've got a program called ASEAN and Beyond. So in the way that the UK reached out into Malaysia 20 years ago, we're now reaching out into ASEAN. So one project we've got with the World Bank actually um, is upskilling about 10 and a half thousand students in Bangladesh, not students, sorry, college and university professors in Bangladesh over about five years. That's funded by the World Bank and the National University in, in Bangladesh. Um, and we couldn't have done that from Malaysia, obviously, unless we had been here. But the World Bank wouldn't have chosen to work with the university in the UK because it's just too far away. So there's some positives and we teach in Singapore, India, Sri Lanka, and we've been speaking to Nepal and Thailand and Myanmar and Nepal over the last few years about reaching out. So we're certainly an educational hub and I think we can reach out into ASEAN much more than we're, we're doing at the moment, but we're, we're doing that. But I do think there's some negatives and things that we can do and probably in a follow up to the, the second question about what can we do to improve education and graduate employability, really. Um, I think there needs to be um, joined up thinking between certain ministries. So the ministries we most engage with is the Ministry of Higher Education or the Ministry of Education, depending on what month you're in. The Immigration Department, EMGS, the Education Malaysia Global Services. And now, re more recently, the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, sorry, the Ministry of Human Resources. And each of those ministries, I think, in some ways do a great job, but they don't have joined up thinking. So immigration have the last say, and understandably so, on who can enter the country. Um, but that's a barrier to international students coming into the country. EMGS have a say, Ministry of Higher Education have a say. And more recently, the Ministry of Human Resources have recently said that if you want to advertise a job, um, you have to advertise in Malaysia for 30 days first. And the Ministry of Human Resources will be in the interview. Um, and only once you've, ex um, once you've decided there's no one in Malaysia that can take that job, then you go out into, uh, you can internationally recruit. That's actually been delayed now until January because many of the, um, uh, many agencies, um, took you know it didn't like that for example i know the um uh, the, uh, the the american chamber of commerce made a big um um a big row about it i'm a director of the british malaysia chamber of commerce and we made representation um and it just seems you know a negative way of looking at it i can understand that you want to give good jobs to local people people in malaysia but actually to expand the economy you need international um, you need international minds, international mm. skills. Um, and one of the things we've been working with, with the British Malaysia Chamber of Commerce as a summer director and also chair the uh, Higher Education Committee, is one debate we had was, if you, were, if you study in Malaysia, should you be able to stay in Malaysia and work afterwards? Which it would be a big attraction. The UK did that a few years ago. They stopped it. They've recently brought it back in. So if you study in the UK, you can work in the UK for two years following that. You get a visa. 
um, in Malaysia, as soon as you finished your studies, actually before you even graduate, you have to leave Malaysia. You're not allowed to work in Malaysia. Um, and I can understand the reasons why that's in place, but actually you're just taking out high skilled people from, from Malaysia, which could actually add to the economy. And when we had this session, um, in conjunction with BMCC, it was agreed by all parties, whether you're from Malaysia or whether you're from international, whether you're a student or whether you're a, running a business, that it would be beneficial to Malaysia if you let people stay in Malaysia and actually use those skills and in, you know invested that into the country. And that would be one way of creating high value jobs. The yeah, other issue... Just, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, just, to, just to wind back a little bit, you were saying earlier that uh, we could have done a lot more in terms of education over the last 20 years. Can you be more specific about that? Well, I think, I think when we came out here in 2000, the aim was for Malaysia to be an educational hub, which I believe it is. I mean, it's got, you know, good quality institutions now. It's got five research universities, 15, 15 other public universities, um, 11 foreign branch campuses. But I think there's two things that I think we could have done better. And obviously, 2020 vision is um, a wonderful thing. One is, I think we could have focused more on soft skills. We once had a, um, a UK company come to see us, University of Nottingham, Malaysia, and they said, we want to employ your graduates. We're, you know, we're very sought after as, um, well, as I hope you can imagine. And we said, well, look, we, we're not producing the number of graduates that you need for this UK based company. Why don't you go to another university? And here's a list that you could go to. And they said, yeah, but they don't produce the students with the right soft skills. Um, they can't um, write reports. They can't debate. They can't do presentations. And if you go through a UK style education, not just Nottingham, but if you go through any UK style of education, you have to be able to present. You can't go through a UK degree without presenting, without rewriting a report, um, without being able to debate and put your arguments forward. So I think we should have focused more on soft skills. And I know there's 250,000, I think, unemployed graduates in Malaysia. And one of the barriers to them getting a job is their soft skills. So that's one thing I think that we, we could have improved on. The other thing I think, and, and this goes across the, across the country, I think, is the amount of bureaucracy. We spend a great deal of our time talking to different agencies, filling out forms, debating, trying to get meetings, trying to get decisions. And really, and some of them are just no brainer decisions, but we have to fill in these boxes. We have to fill out these forms. As an example, when we put in something, some, a lot of stuff is online now, but we still have to print it all out. We still have to uh, take it to the ministry and we still have to lodge it with the ministry. If we get a ministry coming to see us to do an audit and we get that quite a lot and understand that, no problem with that. Um, all, the, all the information we have is lodged with them. All the students, we have to lodge any student registrations with the ministry. Then they come and ask us to, to show us what students we've got registered. We say, well, you've got all that. And they say, no, we need it. We need it printed out, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just so much bureaucracy in, in Malaysia that it, it, just drives, it just drives me mad. And I don't think it's the fault of, I'm not blaming the ministries here. It's just the way Malaysia has developed and evolved. And they've not really, I'm not, a, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm not a big fan of um, 4IR um, as, as, a, as a term. But we've not embraced the techno technologically um, advance the technological advancements that we could have done over the last few years, and I think we need to do that, um, and that will lead to high skilled, high paid jobs. Um, and the, I'll, I'll wrap up in a minute. But the, fi the final point is, I think that well, two final points. One is the U the university, the government wants to bring in two hundred and fifty thousand international students by twenty twenty five. That's their target. Uh, even without COVID, they would struggle to do that. And that's because of things like bureaucracy and um, not being able to, you know, process these students. COVID's not helped, of course. Um, and I've forgotten the last point I was going to make, so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, we can come back to that later. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to the questions. And uh, speakers, I mean, uh, whoever wants to respond, uh, just go ahead and respond to these questions. The first one, uh, this is from Ramesh Rajaradnam. How do we respond to the unfair allocation to the non malays in the 2021 budget? This is, is the precursor to beyond 
nothing will go beyond 2020 if the mindset is still in 1970. So, I mean, uh, uh, quite valid question about the mindset. You know, how can we do something about the mindset? Anyone? Taufik? Um, I think um, the question of allocation uh, has come out because of the current uh, 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 political stresses on the government, where they're trying to be uh, an all Malay government in a multiracial country. And they're trying to prove to the Malays that they're doing more than they, than they need to do. And I think this is the kind of misappropriation of priorities, which is um, uh, rather um, negative for the country. We don't mm -hmm. look at um, the, the society as a whole, where there is an interdependency of, um, of needs. And I think this is something which um, uh, the government is lacking in. Uh, they don't seem to have a balance in, 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 the, in the policy making and the allocation of resources. Do you see any way out of this you know, uh, in the short term? Is, is there any kind of, uh, what will change uh, these kind of uh, attitudes? Well, since, since you've um, gone the direction of an all Malay government, you need to educate the Malays a bit more into being more inclusive. I think um, uh, the, the political reality is already entrenched right now. It's very difficult to shake out the, um, uh, the pro-Malay uh, bias in government and in um, uh, the way things are managed. But I think uh, uh, if you convince the Malays that they can be dominant without being dominating, I think this is a step in the, in the direction which we should all try to um, achieve. Okay. Thank you. Can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think I think it is this issue is a lot more uh, acute um, right now. It's uh, you know a bit more uh, stark. The first thing I think the the numbers would be also the disparity between allocations that are specific for some women portray agencies and and causes and institutions and loans and and all of that uh, versus others that actually have that uh, designation for Chinese or Indian or an Asli. Uh, I mean, those institutions don't exist in the first place, right? And every year it's it's about the same in that you have a lot of allocations because of the existence of a lot of boom portrait agencies. But I think in the in in the context of, of pandemic, in the context of uh, resorting to uh, EPF, old age account one withdrawals uh, of a drastic reduction in, in wage subsidies when the priority should be on a lot more on, on, on income um, and and uh, sustain, sustaining uh, yeah, living. Um, yeah. I, I think it, it, it just stand out a, a little bit more, but I think it's also a moment to ask the question, you know, uh, because firstly, to be more pinpointed and specific, right? Because there is there are programs that are for the Indian community, like in Tukun. So that's the micro, uh, micro finance. So you have Tukun for Bumi Putra and there's one program for, for Indians. We can narrow in on that. And there was 20 million for Indians for under Tukun. Now there's a combined 500 million for Tukun and PUNB for Bumi Putras. I think it's a moment for people to also engage a bit more in the specifics because there you can actually see the stark difference. And also you have to ask the question, are we against designating four groups or are we against the imbalance? Because you don't want to come across as just opposing whatever is for Bumiputra and then embracing if it's for Indian. So but I think so again, the focus should be on there is if, if there is a need that these are targeted for particular disadvantaged groups, then engage in that on the basis of you know uh, some some uh, conviction or principle that, that that they can function as a role, and then you engage in the specifics as well about what is allocated for Indians under the Kun mm -hmm. as well as Boon Putras under the same the Kun. Yep. Uh, at this point, maybe I would uh, like to introduce a question, I think, which is on uh, many people's minds. And in fact, uh, people like Dr. Lim Teki has uh, recently written about the Guinea. So should we, uh, uh, sh should we dismantle a race-based policy you know? so, and instead implement a plan which goes according to needs, which is a needs-based policy, and uh, if, in, if indeed uh, the, uh, the Bumiputra group is the poorest, then would, they will get automatically uh, get help the most. Any, any, anyone who would like to comment? 
Can I maybe make a make a suggestion or a point on that? Um, I think I think the the government and the the the, uh, the country as a whole should be a bit more challenge itself maybe to leave more to market forces. And I'll give you just a brief experience. I'm the University of Nottingham Malaysia is um, part of a large company with a minority shareholder. Actually, our Malaysia uh, we've got a Malaysia company which is a majority shareholder. So I go to meetings with about. 15 other companies I'm the CEO so I go with all the other CEOs and I looked around the room one day and all the CEOs apart from myself were Malaysian and generally Malay um, and I I didn't question it I mean I understand but I, I did think out of all those 15 companies do we have the best in the world leading these companies and I'm sure in in that context we did because I don't want to disparage any of my colleagues in the room um, but I couldn't believe that, you know, if you've got 15 world leading companies, have we got the best of the best in the room? Um, and, 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 you know, uh, you know, we can all um, wonder why and what happened, etc. and probably come up with the same conclusion. But actually, why I think Malaysia, in some respects, should have the confidence to leave things to market forces. A lot of things, and it goes back to the bureaucracy argument, a lot of things seems to be micromanaged. Well, just leave things to market forces. And we've said that this in higher education, the private institutions, certainly the foreign branch campuses, are different to a public institution. And just let us do what we're good at and don't micromanage us, as which is what they do. And they do that a lot. And I sort of that come back to me just now when I thought about looking around that room and seeing that everybody was um, drawn from Malaysia. Um, and it wasn't, you know, their world leading companies wasn't open to being led by other people. Um, and you look at the universities, the public universities, they're all run by Malaysians and very well, very good vice chancellors in Malaysia. Um, but I could never be the vice chancellor of the University of Malaya. Not that I'd want to be just for, on the record, but I could never that that job is not open to me. But the vice chancellor of the University of Malaysia could be the vice chancellor of the University of Nottingham yeah. or a, a, an American university. So I think they should they should be more be more confident to leave leave a lot of things up to market forces. Yeah, perhaps. All right. Uh, yes, uh, market forces. But here uh, we are talking about maybe. Uh, uh, rectifying a situation where there is a gap in incomes and there is therefore a need for affirmative action. So perhaps, uh, you know, the affirmative action could just uh, be based basically on needs and then uh, dismantle the race thing because there have been a lot of advances which have been made uh, for Bumiputras in the country. And so anybody else? Yeah, can I, uh, can I come in? Oh, go ahead. No, just on a, on a point that is uh, connected to what we have been uh, discussing and something we have raised earlier. Um, and this is the whole question of Malaysia's uh, tax and transfer uh, system. Uh, when you look at it very carefully, uh, you notice that it's not as effective as it should be uh, and, and in terms of redistributing resources and then trying to remove uh, or minimize disparities and inequalities. And in fact, when you look at Malaysia's Gini uh, coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, and you look at Sweden's uh, Gini coefficient, before tax and transfer, they're, they're almost equal. But when Sweden then puts into effect its, its redistributive policies based on tax and transfer, Sweden goes down, but Malaysia stays very much at the same level. So this goes to my earlier point that new policies have to be thought of how it raises revenues, how it redistributes them uh, to help uh, remove uh, those or minimize uh, those disparities. And it's all the more important now uh, in this recession that we are in because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And you know, I, I just wanna stress that the most vulnerable households now and, and workers are those workers who are not the high skilled, but the low skilled. And in fact, when we, we look at the labor force, you know, maybe 60%, 70% of low skilled workers cannot work from home um, and they have to work outside of the home and in, in, in situations where there's not too much physical uh, distancing. Um, so that really, uh, I think, is a, is a big challenge uh, for the government, which uh, explains a lot of maybe the, the, the programs going into trying to protect uh, some of the, the labor force. And just if you permit me, Gorek, to go back to a point that uh, Professor uh, Graham was talking about, these soft skills, 
um, that uh, people really, um, I think, appreciate now. When we, when we did a lot of survey work and we are doing a lot of survey work, work with firms in Malaysia, small, medium and large, one of the biggest constraints that they cite um, is being able to recruit the necessary skills uh, to become more productive, to grow and so on. And when you dig deeper, uh, you ask them what kind of skills that you're looking for. Uh, two stand out, digital uh, skills, okay. but then they mention the social emotional skills, the life sort of skills, which, which are very, very important. And uh, I think uh, you know, more focus should, uh, should be on, on them in the educational system and then uh, uh, in the job when they, when they go for on the job training. So just a quick intervention from my side. Yeah. Uh, Rinald, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, I want to say a lot of things when I'm <laughs> holding back because <laughs> I don't want to just go on. Um, I, I would like to share something that uh, I think Taufik would agree with. Uh, it's something because his father and my father were very close. Um, and uh, it was Tun Razak and uh, Tun Dr. Ismail that appointed my father, Tan Sri Sheikha, as the head of uh, the RRI and Malaysian rubber as chairman of Malaysia at the time when rubber was 70% of Malaysia GDP. Um, and I remember that my father telling me that the conversation he had with Tun Raza and Tun Dr. Ismail was, you know, we need to build Malay capacity. And to him, that's what NEP was. We need to build Malay capacity to ensure that they can be competitive. We need to train. We need to give them the skill sets and the confidence so that they can lead in these industries that are otherwise now taken on by other races. Um, and that was, that was what was told to him to do, to build, which is what he, he did. The problem was after then the new governments that came in after that, their focus changed saying, look, that's not it. The better way is just to appoint right at the top and just create uh, these heads of organizations and CEOs of GLCs and, and companies. And just, you know, that will then trickle down. Now that's been a total and unadulterated failure in our system. Um, because it hasn't created capacity. And the capacity that we created, when they're good, they're taken away from us, right? Let's be very clear, if you go to Singapore, some of the biggest companies in Singapore, some of the biggest departments and, 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 and uh, uh, GLCs in Singapore are run by Malaysians. They've been hired by Malaysians to go over there. Mm. You can find them in Australia. You can find them almost everywhere in the world. And it becomes a question mark then, how come the best that we have here leave? And that goes down again to our, our race-based policies and race-based economics. Race-based policy and race-based economics, as is a fact, has failed simply because it's not helped the hardcore poor. More than 80% of the hardcore poor in this country are still Malays after however many years of, of economic policies that have been you know, focused on one race or another. Um, it's caused other issues, obviously, and it's chased talent out of Malaysia. Because when you have that situation, you have to dumb down our universities, going back to what Graham says. Now, many people might not like me to say that, but it is dumbed down. The reality is most of my colleagues in multinationals, most of my friends uh, who are CEOs of major companies that are hiring, when they get their CVs, and this is, might be unpopular, but when they get CVs, they will take CVs from national universities and put it at the bottom. And only if they can't find anyone else, Will they start looking at the CVs from national universities? Now, this might be not nice and it's not fair, but these are the facts that we're dealing with in, in the commercial sector. So there are many issues that have to be dealt with. It's not just one or two. It's endemic. It's across the board that we have to change a mindset. The system is broken. It can't be band-aids. It can't be band-aids anymore. It's broken. We need to fix it all. And that's the challenge. Guna, could I add to something? Sorry. Yeah, sure. It follows on there because uh, you have reinforced, I think, what I was presenting earlier, that the focus needs to be on developing capacity, confidence, right, competitiveness, and so on, which actually also underscores the other point I was making, which is that the NEP made a distinction about the need-based pro-poor policies as distinct, and they cannot one substitute the other, although there's an overlap. And I think we need to, this is where we need to be more specific rather than this kind of slogan about replacing need base, you know, take instead of uh, race base. Because mm -hmm. there are these policy areas, higher education, and specifically in uh, what Dr. Vino was talking about, which was in, you know, employment, right, in, in promotion, in gaining skills. I mean, you can't really go about that because essentially we're talking about instead of being given preference to race, Abu Putra, give preference to the poor. 
uh, you can't really do the, go about it that way when it comes to things like you know uh, an organize uh, 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 enterprise, right? How you promote people. It has to be based on capability or potential and an environment whereby you know those who have that ability and potential get uh, nurtured. But in higher education, that kind of need base as a replacement for race base has has more scope. But I think we 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 cannot think about it, you know, uh, and with, in sweeping terms because in higher education it's different from enterprise development, from from employment, you know, and those other spheres. So, you know, keep so, it specific to higher education. What you're saying is that needs based in some areas and uh, race based in others. Isn't it? Could I could I could I interrupt very quickly? Yeah. Just, just Sorry, say, <laughs> I think to say what the professor. I think what you're trying to say is this: it's very simple. We all have to to accept one fact: the Malays are the majority in this country, all right? They are the backbone of this country, whether anyone likes it or not. And if the backbone is weak, the ancillary units, the, 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 the organs, the limbs can't operate, just can't. That's just the way it is, this country's that way. So we can't change that fact. The Malays are the mantra. Now, the, having a strong backbone, right, is pointless if you can't operate the limbs and the organs fail, they go together. But we have to accept that if we can have a strong spine, if we can have a confident Malay race, confident Malays that feel confident and they feel the comfort, that then allows the entire organ, the entire body to succeed. And that's the balance we have to find. You, it's not just a question of needs based, it's a question of looking at the situation and saying, well, fine, how do you bring confidence back to the Malays? How does Malay leadership, government leadership, ensure that the Malays can be lifted and feel confident because when they feel confident as the majority, they can take care of the minority. They are there to, to ensure the minority can rise with them. And together is how the country can move forward. And that's a leadership right now that's missing. All right. Um, uh, thanks for that, uh, Vinod. Uh, let's uh, move on to some of the questions. Uh, there are two interesting questions here where, where they are asking what they can do. All right, uh, the first one, uh, let me just quickly read it out from Angeline Lin, we need both long-term vision as well as an immediate practicable action plan. Foremost of all, justice requires eliminating race-based approaches in addressing inequitable distribution of wealth. With regard to the grossly inequitable budget 2021 allocations that will heavily burden the, uh, burden the disadvantage of all races who are really struggling to survive in the pandemic, please provide suggestions on what ordinary citizens can do to begin to address this. So this, uh, uh, this is a quote here as well. To what extent can the public civil society be an effective uh, actor in this space? This is from Noor Shafina Shaharuddin. Anybody wants to take that? I mean, what can the ordinary public do in terms of, uh, of, of uh, doing something about, uh, about, equitable, uh, equi uh, about equity? Guna, can I come in and just say something general about the budget um, and the trade-offs that the, the government is facing? Mm -hmm. Can I come in, Guna? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, so I, I just want to reiterate this point that I think the Malaysian government and all governments around the world in the midst of this pandemic have been adopting um, expansionary budgets. And I think that's just the, the way it is because uh, uh, the whole, you know, uh, economy of the world, more than 190 uh, countries around the world um, are experiencing uh, a severe economic uh, downturn. And in downturns, you have to spend and spend wisely to protect uh, lives and, and livelihoods. And uh, you do what you can to, to get through the storm while you're in it, uh, while keeping this question of, you know, deficit spending and debts and increasing debt burden in, in, in mind. And, and so I, I think, you know, the Malaysian government is not alone in a, adopting an, a, an expansionary budget. Um, and now the question is how uh, it spends it uh, to protect the vulnerable, to make sure people are employed and re-employed, uh, upskilled, uh, reskilled, make sure that the, the cash transfers go to the people who deserve it the, the most, um, and then to try to push the economy towards uh, towards recovery. But I, I think uh, for us, I, it's uh, and this has come up in different uh, debates and, and discussions, I think, publicly. Uh, but I, I think this, the, on the face of it, the government has to spend now, like many other governments around the world. And the question is on, on what is it spending and 
is it doing it uh, in the best way? Yep, and it, uh, there's a lot of opinion that it doesn't seem to be at this point of time. And uh, oh, well, you, you, you're talking about say using taxation and things like that as a tool of uh, distribution, but that implies that the government does its job properly as far as that is concerned. If it doesn't, then wouldn't it be uh, even greater wastage as a result? Well, I mean, this is the, you know, the, the, there is this question of raising revenue and the, the government, I think, announced a medium term revenue uh, strategy, mm -hmm. which is, is, is very important because I said, as I said in my initial remarks, you know, there, there is this question of how Malaysia is going to finance its transition yeah. going forward, given the low level of revenues it already um, raises. And then plus the, the, the added question of population aging in a higher proportion of retirees and, and so on. So it's, it's very important that it raises enough and then it spends uh, wisely. So, and, and typically, you know, the, the principle is you, you tax according to income or wealth, and then you, you spend according to need. And on the need side, you know, there, I think more could be done in terms of targeting. You have to really target your assistance to those that need it the most, the bottom 20, the bottom. 40. Um, and, and I think Malaysia, when you look at its social spending overall, it spends very little as a percentage of its GDP on social assistance and, and more can be done. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, one more question here, anonymous attendee. I'm not uh, doubting the importance of industrialization. Why is agriculture looked down when if done properly, uh, properly can generate income for the country? Joe, this is something is uh, up your street. Uh, sure, why not? Um, <laughs> I think um, I think it's very important for us to use this uh, opportunity. I think um, it's generally recognized that some of the supply chain disruptions due to COVID-19 and uh, re political responses. For example, uh, the President of the United States as well as the Prime Minister of, of Japan have called, they asked for their companies to, to withdraw the investments from China. And this will obviously have uh, a lot of repercussions for those of us who are integrated with the Chinese economy, including Malaysia. So this is extremely disruptive. So we need to think very, very ca uh, carefully about what uh, is likely. I don't think it's useful for us to talk about a new normal because uh, there's going to be nothing terribly normal. It's going to be constantly changing and so on. But I do think it is important for us to begin to realize that, uh, for example, food supply chains are going to be massively disrupted. So the call for us to rethink uh, agriculture and to do much more with agriculture is very important. I think there are two types of agriculture in Malaysia, which everybody knows about. One is the export-oriented agriculture, uh, which has been the mainstay. Uh, rubber has been mentioned. And of course, uh, palm oil is the most significant uh, product right now. And there are huge opportunities as far as palm oil is concerned, particularly with the development and promotion of palm oil-based biodiesel something which was first developed in Malaysia in the 1980s, but sadly has been neglected ever since then. There has been very little push uh, towards promoting biodiesel, and there have been very few complementary policies uh, by the government to address this. Uh, as far as uh, uh, we all also know that uh, the latex uh, gloves manufacturers and so on uh, have, have been doing very well. They've had windfall profits. And here we have to think very seriously about uh, the possibility of, introdu of introducing windfall profits. This has been done before in the case of windfall profits from the higher price of, uh, of, of, uh, of petrol or petroleum oil. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be. So by making a special deal uh, with uh, five uh, gloves manufacturers, I think we set a very bad precedent. We really have to regularize this rather than make these private deals with big corporate players as has been, as has been the case. I think the third area, of course, is the, is the whole question of, of, uh, of uh, food. Um, unfortunately, for almost a century since the colonial period, we have had a priority of emphasizing uh, rice production, uh, rice self-sufficiency. 
we have never thought about food security in a far more integrated fashion. And we have never seen it in relation to, for example, uh, improving uh, the nutrition of Malaysians. Um, as uh, Dr. Firas Ra'ad, who is a public health specialist, knows very well, uh, we have a great number of non-communicable diseases in Malaysia. Almost uh, uh, the current Malaysian life expectancy is somewhere in the region of about 75. But the last decade, on average, uh, is uh, actually a non-healthy years. Uh, so what is called healthy average life expectancy is actually severely compromised. It's closer to about 65. And so we really need to think about improving our food. And there are two major problems. One is that we are not, we are not, we are not uh, eat, uh, eating uh, enough uh, uh, micronutrients, or particularly vegetable, uh, sorry, vitamins as well as minerals, which are very badly needed. And on the other hand, we have a lot of unnecessary non-communicable diseases due to poor eating habits, poor diets, very often promoted by large food corporations and so on and so forth. So, so we have a very perverse situation. And then we have an additional problem that we have the use of a lot of uh, agro, uh, toxic agrochemicals. We need to do much, much more. So we, we have proposed uh, for some time now, uh, unfortunately, uh, no, uh, none of the the three uh, governments, the last three governments have actually paid any attention in, to it, but we, we believe that it is important for all children in this, uh, prim especially primary school children, to have a school meal program, a lunch program. Um, and uh, that, that has a tremendous uh, social benefits as well, as we know, for example, from Japan and many other societies. But the whole idea is to have a, a, a a, a, a meal, at least one meal in school, which fulfills at least the micronutrient requirements and provides some of the macronutrient needs uh, as well. Uh, and this can easily be done with re at relatively low cost, and especially with the increased uh, consumption of uh, vegetables and fruits, which can be la largely locally sourced. And, um, but unfortunately, right now, the existing supplementary food program is in the hands of uh, largely uh, food corporations, uh, which of course make a lot of money. And we have the very unfortunate uh, syndrome now of because of COVID-19, a great deal of people, a great number of, of people, not just children, eating, uh, relying on uh, instant uh, uh, noodles, for example, uh, and, and eating meals like that, which are far from adequate and so on. So I think there is a great deal of room for you know, integration between the agriculture ministry, the health ministry, as well as the uh, education ministry, okay. to try to develop these programs. But unfortunately, we don't see that kind of thinking coming about. If I may emphasize that what we really need is an all of government approach. You know, it's not just the health ministry and the, uh, and, and the ministry of home affairs we should be dealing with, with the pandemic and all of government approach, which works closely with society to convince society about the need. We have a number of societies in East Asia, starting from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, China itself, Vietnam, Laos, and of course, Kerala and Southwest India, which have never had so, so far uh, stay, in, stay in shelter lockdowns. Okay, and they have been able to get through this crisis very, very well. Even though they were some, all these countries were the first to be hit by the, by, by COVID nineteen, and so we there's a great deal to learn from this from the experiences of of uh, our East Asian neighbors, uh, and we should be having a, a completely different approach and involving the public. If the public doesn't understand, if the public doesn't understand the rationale for why one in 10 can go, uh, is allowed to go to office and not more, uh, then the, you are not going to have uh, public support for a public policy of such great importance as we are. And we are, we are li li liable to, so, so there is a great deal of suspicion. Whereas the prime minister used to have a great deal of support and approval ratings were over 80% at one stage. Now his approval ratings have gone down and, and even the confidence in the Director General uh, of the Ministry of Health has, has been affected. And there's a great deal of concern about, about you know, the confidence in public policy is greatly undermined. All right. 
Uh, thanks, Jomo. I think the, the, uh, we have about 20 minutes left on this. So uh, I think what I will do is uh, basically go around each of the participants and uh, the, the speakers, I mean, and, uh, and uh, maybe uh, enumerate two to three points uh, about what you would like to see in terms of bringing about growth with equity in the new decade. So uh, can we start with, uh, with uh, Hua Kwan, please? Okay, so I think there were a lot of questions that uh, were um, sort of under the theme of, of, of income. And I think it's an opportunity then maybe to speak uh, in, in, I think, two, about uh, two, two broad pillars, uh, policies addressing issues of income. Because again, I want to stress that uh, the policies that are uh, framed around uh, race primarily do uh, uh, target outcomes related to opportunity and capacity building with income as a secondary um, and an indirect uh, outcome. So I think for, for income, uh, I think there's a lot to, uh, I mean, I think we, we can recognize some of the things that are in, in motion income as well as welfare and social protection. We have minimum wage, we need to press for, you know, uh, the uh, increases, but not just about how it's conventionally viewed in sort of this monthly uh, minimum wage because it, its level is also determined on an hourly basis based on 48 hours per week of work. So it would I think be a bigger... tied up with productivity, wouldn't it? You know, so how do you, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess the, the structural shift towards higher productivity, I mean, it will involve many factors, but I think including sort of on more on, on the cost push uh, side, um, cost push in the sense that, you know, if, if, the, uh, if the hourly wages are, are much more steeply increased and the, the penalties for, uh, for, for overtime and, and depending on uh, working, you know, on a term we use overwork, right? Uh, high number of hours per work, which I think is an underlying factor behind having so many uh, low skill uh, foreign workers who are willing to put up with all that overtime. Right now it's at 48 per week and there's still resistance to moving it down to 40 hours per week. Uh, even ministry is, uh, there, there are some uh, deliberations that propose that, but government resists push, uh, reducing it, you know, maybe I'll scale it down from 48 to 40. I mean, those kind of things that are not really talked about enough, I think along the lines of improving uh, work conditions as well as income and welfare. In other words, mm -hmm. you ask employers to pay their employees more. So that's what you're advocating. But also a bit more restructuring towards, yeah, pushing for, you know, for, and I think trying to marry what we're, what, what the national objectives are of work-life balance. So when we talk about productivity, we should zoom in, not just about the overall and wages, but on what is, what is hourly wages so that it's not productivity that still is dependent on, you know, overworking on very, you know, high uh, exertion, but more on being very efficient per hour that is, that is worked. Right. That's a good and important uh, yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And I think to come back to uh, yeah, what I was saying, I think the, the driving focus needs to be, um, you know, firstly recognizing the full range of these policies from the from the second prong of the NEP, um, and and the ultimate objective of them, which is to develop the capability, the, the confidence, because it is the majority group, right, that have to um, will have to contemplate and have to take action in terms of uh, reforms and how that can be changed and gradually rolled back. I think some can take place already in shifting towards more need-based, especially in education. But for the most part, it has to be still building the capability and finding ways then to, to transition. So I just give you one example. If you talk about need-based, in, in university, yes, you can say, let's give a bit more priority to those from disadvantaged backgrounds because of we recognize that uh, you know, there are circumstances beyond their control and therefore uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that and not exactly place everyone on par in terms of the usual qualifications like grades, right? So you let some in from lower income backgrounds and disadvantage. Uh, but you can't apply that kind of need basis when it comes to government procurement, right? Are, you, are we going to then say give more contracts to kampongs, give more contracts to poorer people? So yeah. that has to be in terms of giving that more allocation to those who are capable. But we can invert that and say that, look, maybe there are some limits on how long you can receive preferential treatment. So you don't, you stop giving preferential treatment because people don't need it 
because they've received it a few times. Or you can give it to the younger contractors, but again, there is a, an, some expiry to that. But again, clear, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to not make this kind of sweeping, and, and I think it's still very, very nebulous a notion of the whole thing being need-based as a substitution. I think it's not gotten us anywhere after okay. about 10 years. We need to be very specific about how it's applied to the different policy areas. Thank you, Rotan. Uh, Graham, uh, uh, over to you now. Uh, maybe we can speak about what we, uh, you know, the, we, we uh, I think uh, one of the, pro uh, the serious problems we have is education and how to lift educational standards. But uh, feel free to touch on any other thing that you want. I think yeah. that the remaining speakers about, have about three minutes each. Okay. Um, so thanks. So you asked for maybe three points of what we could actually do, and uh, I won't harp on this point, but certainly we should have less bureaucracy in the country um, and more digitization. And I think more digitization would actually um, create highly skilled jobs because you need highly skilled jobs who understand that. So that's something certainly we could do. And I would, I would welcome that as someone who runs a university. I think Malaysia should be more confident in leaving a lot of things to market forces rather than trying to micromanage it. Um, I, I can only speak for the higher education sector, actually, but I, I see that every day in my life. You know, we get micromanaged and for good reason, but it's just the, the country should have the confidence to leave things, a lot more things to market forces. I think... Um, I think we probably, and I, I would say that at the beginning of this talk, but actually listening to some of the other panelists and some looking at some of the questions and comments, there probably does need to be targeted areas as there does probably in any country. The danger is, is that those targeted areas become ever more wide and, you know, that it becomes, someone thinks a targeted area is there for not, because it should be a targeted area for political, political reasons. So, you know, you have to be really strict on what your targeted areas are, but leave things to market forces. And then I think coming back to uh, probably what Datuk Vinod said, we need to, I think, stop the brain drain. There's lots of people, the University of Nottingham in the UK is a destination. People want to go there, finish their academic career there and retire, it, uh, retire from the University of Nottingham in the UK. University of Nottingham, Malaysia is really a stepping point. People come here and either do a PhD or start their first academic job, and then they go to Australia or Singapore or somewhere else because the wages are much higher. So, you know, we, we're we exact opposite almost to the, our same university in the UK. So we need to stop the brain drain, but also we need to attract international talent. We need people coming in who have got the skills that we don't have in Malaysia. Um, and that goes back to the point I was making earlier on about looking around the room of my uh, peer CEOs. But also, we, we've got, I don't know how many um, international students we've got at the moment, probably about 150,000. We'll offer some of them the opportunity to stay in Malaysia for a year or two years to work afterwards, because we've spent a lot of time and effort educating them, and certainly in in the private sector and, and the public sector to a certain extent, but they've got a lot of technical knowledge. They've got a lot of soft skill knowledge. We'll let them invest that back into Malaysia for a little while, and then they can go and get another job somewhere else. So I would go less bureaucracy, more digitization, leave a lot more things to market forces, stop the brain drain, but also in, attract international skills to uh, create high value jobs. Thank you very much. Uh, Firas? Okay, thanks, Guna. Uh, if you permit me, Guna, I just want to go back very quickly to sure. um, some of the health points that Professor Jomo mentioned. I can't resist them. Maybe a bit on COVID-19. Um, but but I, I think, you know, some of the additional challenges um, in addition to the NCDs are the risks that begin very early on in life. And it's also connects, connected to the NCD challenge. And we know in Malaysia that, say, about 20% of of children um, are stunted, and this cuts across uh, all ethnic groups, all income levels, and 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 this nutritional problem is a is a tremendous challenge for the society and for the government, and they have to think about that. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have 20% of of children that are either overweight or obese. So you have this dual nutritional problem um, that the, the the country has to has to deal with, and we're even seeing you know amongst households in uh, these public uh, housing projects in the PPR flats, the, the resurgence of intestinal parasites. And, and so that is not a good uh, indicator because these PPR flats, these housing projects were supposed to be the ticket for many uh, 
uh, households to rise through society, to go to the middle class. And then, but we're seeing now some of these, these bad signs uh, emerging. Uh, now, in terms of your question going forward, Guna, I, I would just re-emphasize what I said uh, before. I think, you know, when you think about growth with equity, if you think about the first part, growth, you need to revitalize the, the main drivers of, of growth in Malaysia and their investment, productivity, uh, female labor force participation, and then human capital outcomes, especially uh, education. Uh, then in terms of the quality of growth, as, as I said, you know, the government needs to think about high quality jobs. It needs to think about competitiveness, um, how it's going to finance this transition, and then institutions. And many speakers talked about the quality of, uh, of institutions. And then lastly, the equity part, um, I, I really think, and I emphasize this to, today, is you know, more should be done on, on social protection to ensure that there are greater uh, equity outcomes, you know, ones that are very uh, palpable, you know, both on the social assistance side and on social uh, insurance, because on, on both ends, there, there are gaps uh, at the moment. So with that, uh, many thanks, uh, Gun, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Taufik? Thank you, Guna. Um, I, I would like to summarize uh, by putting forward a um, post-2020 uh, scenario uh, based on three, the three Ps. Uh, the first P is um, get rid of parallel government, which has uh, been a trademark of Mahade's administration when he was prime minister, where um, you can do away with uh, a parallel institutions like JAKIM or JASA, when the ministries to do what these uh, bodies are doing already exist in health and in um, commerce and in uh, communication. I think um, doing away with parallel institutions create a better budget. The second P is um, convince the Malays that it's probably better to go for practical uh, pursuits in terms of education and in training than to go for pure religious based um, uh, activities or ideas, which is uh, the, the favorite um, uh, topic of uh, politicians in Malaysia nowadays do away with race and go for the practical side of um, life, uh, especially for the Malays. Uh, teach them that business is a better occupation than being an ustaz or a religious teacher in the rural areas. Um, the, the economic well-being of a, of a group uh, tends to uplift uh, uh, everything that they need to live for. The third P is, let's have a political politics. In other words, um, let us promise and deliver what we promise. And not like um, what was done during the last general election, where you have a lot of promises and you cannot fulfill uh, the major promises you made. I think uh, principal politics is very important. And um, in the past, where uh, parties stood on platforms and on uh, principles which were easy to understand. Uh, it was easier to attract leaders to uh, move the country forward. Those are the three things which I would like to uh, summarize. Guna, we can't hear you. Thank you, Taufik, for that. Uh, Jomo, what about your take? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gunnar. Allow me to make uh, two, two sets of closing remarks. Uh, firstly, I think uh, I want to reiterate what uh, Dr. Firas Raad said earlier about uh, the fact that almost most governments in the world are running into deficit with their budgets right now. Uh, there is no way to raise money um, uh, from surpluses, the exception probably being Germany, uh, very few other countries with huge surpluses to draw upon. Uh, and so I think it is inevitable that there will be 
uh, there, there will be a significant borrowing. My problem is not really with the extent of the borrowing, but rather uh, with the way the money is going to be spent. And if we look at the money which, uh, of which there is a great deal, the amount of money being spent uh, is, is obviously going to be greater, but a lot of it has got next to nothing to do with relief and recovery. Uh, a lot of it has to do with a whole lot of other problems. And I think as uh, Hohan correctly emphasized, uh, we, we, you know, whether or not it is called uh, for, uh, it is earmarked for an ethnic group is almost irrelevant uh, because uh, we often find that uh, the way things work is that uh, money which is going to be ultimately allocated, even if it's not designated for a particular ethnic group, it is going to go to a particular uh, uh, set of people. Uh, what many people refer to as cronyism and so on and so forth. But this has been the norm in this country for, for decades now. The second point related to that, of course, is that there has been understandable concern about affirmative action policies and yet more of the same uh, in, 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 the, in the current period. I think as, uh, again, Hokan emphasized, uh, I think we have to get beyond this simple thing of being for or against affirmative action. If we look, for example, there's a great deal of stuff which goes on. Uh, it's about affirmative action, but it's not called affirmative action. Uh, if you look, for example, at, at uh, the objections to meritocrat to, to the, the merits, ostensibly meritocratic objections uh, to, to affirmative action, which uh, go on in India. Uh, it is really a question of retaining privilege, privilege particularly of the Brahmin caste uh, against others who are now being enabled uh, ever since the Mandal Commission to get into uh, higher institutions of higher education and so on and so forth. So you can have something being said, not in, the, in terms of a particular ethnic group or a particular caste, but it effectively is about affirmative action. Now, Hokan has done work in the past which, which has shown that the discrimination is not only in the public sector, but also in a practice uh, by the private sector. Now, if we look at what, what is affirmative action about in many of our countries, unfortunately, what happened is that um, the, the new dispensation in South Africa after 1994 adopted uh, NEP type policies. It called it BEE, Black Economic Empowerment. And we have re-imported the same thing as Bumiputra Economic Empowerment. But how, how many people benefited from BEE in South Africa? You have a few billionaires, uh, including the current president and, 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 and uh, uh, Tokyo Sexuale and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, um, has it benefited or helped the vast majority of the black people in, the, in, in South Africa? Unfortunately, not. So I think we have to be very, very careful about getting beyond this simplistic uh, ethnic categories and look at the nature of the policies which are being uh, employed, which are being deployed, and how they are affecting people. Uh, finally, I want to thank you for this opportunity again, and I want to wish everybody well, and to uh, particularly Taufik, who has uh, uh, come out of uh, of his uh, of his health uh, problems, to, to to join us today. Thank you. Thank you, Jomo. Um, Vinod, would you like to make some remarks? Uh, yeah, sorry, thank you. I first want to thank everybody uh, for an amazing session. Uh, and thank you for giving the time. Um, for my closing with a few, few short words, I'm, I lack both the uh, intellectual and academic depth of everyone else on this panel, so I'm not going to try. Um, but I guess I'll just give the very, you know, this, my, my, my standard perspective that we have to accept that, um, you know, we built a beautiful house when we became independent. Uh, the Malaysian house was beautiful for what it was, multiracial, multi-ethnic, uh, with a strong future. Uh, we would give blessed with the resources that most other countries didn't have and an education system that most countries didn't have. So we, we had it all. Uh, the problem is as we grew, rather than fix uh, problems that occurred like uh, termites and rot and infrastructure, uh, we just kept putting Band-Aid around it. We just kept, you know, putting the facade, improving the facade, putting nice glass frontage, expanding it, but never dealing with the rock that was 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 coming in, uh, with the termites, with the silverfish, with everything that was coming in. We've now reached a stage where the house is about to fall. 
it is about a fall, and I'm, and I'm, I'm certain of it. Um, we can't carry on like this. We need to accept that we need to tear down this house and build a new house for this generation, for the next generation, uh, built for purpose, for, for the future. Uh, this pandemic has been uh, bad globally. Um, the good side is it is global. We are not alone in what we're facing. And, and Professor uh, Jomo is absolutely right. Um, you know, we're gonna have to borrow it. It's just, it's a reality. Everyone has to. Um, it's allocation, how the money is used uh, is the critical part of everything. We have to rebuild, um, but we can take advantage of the situation now. This pandemic gives us an opportunity to rebuild in the right way to fix. Uh, and it's just a question whether uh, political leadership is there to take advantage of the opportunity right now to do what the country needs for the future. And uh, Tafik, thank you for coming on. I know you've been well and well. Thank you for, for coming on to this and thank you all uh, for, for spending time with us here. I hope we can do this again. Uh, Gunnar, thank you. Pass back to you. Well, uh, looks like it comes down to political leadership. There are no lack of ideas, there are no lack of people, but uh, what we terribly lack is good political leadership at this point of time. So uh, finally, I, I would like to thank uh, the participants uh, and, and the uh, very generous contribution at the time for this. And uh, we hope to do more of uh, such uh, forums in future to discuss things of importance uh, to the country and internationally as well. And my apologies to the attendees, although many of them asked questions, I couldn't get around to, to answering many of the questions. So, and uh, thanks uh, for attending uh, this session. And uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, we have come to the conclusion of this. I was wondering at first, how can we continue with this for two hours? It looks like we may, we could even continue a bit further than two hours. So it's been a quite an interesting discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, okay. Gunnar. Thanks, Gunnar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, oh, Gunnar. Yeah. And uh, thank, thank you, you everyone you. for joining us on our first virtual forum today in which we discussed Beyond Vision 2020, Growth with Equity in the New Decade. And of course, a big thank you to all our speakers today. Um, starting from Professor Jomo, Dr. Firas, Taufi Ismail, Dr. Lee Ho An, and Professor Graham Kendall. And most of all, thank you all for joining us on our virtual forum today. And for those of you who may have missed past part of the forum and would like to, uh, um, or those of you who would like to watch it again, this forum in its recorded form will be available in just a few minutes on YouTube. Thank you very much for your attendance today, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next virtual forum. Thank you.